Yes. Awesome. Great. All right. We're gonna. Let's see. My chat. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We'll we'll figure this out. Yeah. All right. Hi everyone. Thank you for coming out to tonight's meeting. My name is Duran Thweet, and I'm a member of the International Socialist Organization here in Berkeley. Well, Oakland, excuse me. Um, you know, nearby. So, tonight's meeting, if you haven't heard, is um, we have our great speaker, Cece McDonald, joining us tonight. <laughs> so, the meeting's titled Cece McDonald on Racism, Mass Incarceration, and Trans Liberation. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna, basically the format it's gonna be about 30, 40 minutes of just some back and forth, just kind of questions and everything. Then from there, we're gonna have plenty of time for people to ask questions. There are a lot of people in this room, so we're gonna to try to get to as many people as possible. So please bear with us. And I'll explain the process about that in a little bit. So, a question that you, first question that I'm sure you get often. Um, get asked often is what would you like to tell us about your case? Um, well, my case uh, happened in June of 2011. And I, me and some friends were uh, walking to a grocery store um, where we were bombarded with you know, racist and transphobic and homophobic slurs, and that kind of turned into a back and forth altercation uh, where things got physical. Um, I, uh, in defense, me defending myself, someone uh, got stabbed and uh, passed away, and I guess more so for me, the dynamics of the case is what's important, so it's not, mm -hmm. you know, my backstory of the case, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the social uh, or sh the systematic issues that were attached to my case that happens to so many trans women mm -hmm. um, in America. And when, you, when I say the, the systematic things that were connected, I'm talking about, you know, the prison industrial complex and mm -hmm. how that was set up for me to fail anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> police brutality, um, dealing with uh, transphobia in society, dealing with homophobia in society, uh, when it, in regards to my friends and family mm -hmm. that were there. Um, thinking about how I, the capitalistic idea of it, mm -hmm. where I was uh, a black body used for the profit of the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. How I was uh, at birth uh, set up for this failure, mm -hmm. that there was no means for me as a trans woman of color to have not been um, a victim of the prison industrial complex and it was either that or death. Mm -hmm. So I guess my case was more so than, and I say this a lot, it was more so than myself and when I kind of came to grips with that knowing that I was a survivor of hate, I was a survivor of bigotry, I was a su mm -hmm. survivor of the system that it dawned on me that it wasn't about myself, that it was about the larger scale uh, problematic issues that are perpetuating, perpetually uh, devastating communities of color, the LGBTQIA community, uh, just all the people who have been or are in, in oppression, in the intersections of oppression. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So with that, why did you choose to fight this case and who inspired you to fight? Um, well, once I found out that I was charged with murder, um, I initially went into a state of depression, 
Uh, I really didn't know how to deal with this, the situation at hand, because like I said, as a trans woman and a trans woman of color, I constantly uh, dealt with the police, whether it was, you know, them surveilling me and questioning my, my whereabouts or my doings in society when, you know, I'm just standing at the bus stop of school and being accused of prostitution. Mm -hmm. Or if I was arrested for stealing some food out of the grocery store and having to deal with the questions of whether I was on drugs and why I can't, you know, provide for myself and why am I stealing. So I dealt with the police on different terms and I think that those things kind of added to the person that I've always been growing up, mm -hmm. which was outspoken, loud, um, but I also had compassion. I understood what it was like to feel others' pain, mm -hmm. but because society failed me so much, I just became jaded and didn't really care about other people because I felt like that's how they felt about me. Mm -hmm. But when I got into you know, the situation, the incident, and I'm sitting in my cell and I'm getting letters from people who took time out of their day to go, you know, hang out with their friends at support parties for me and write letters of support and tell me how much my case has inspired them or gave them some hope or reassured them as a human being in society to know that other people had been through what I've been through and and also educating myself on the prison industrial complex, the entertainment industrial complex, the medical industrial complex, how those things are tied into the prison industrial complex, learning about my own black history, learning mm -hmm. about my ancestors who paved the way for me, who mm -hmm. kind of got pushed out by other people in society, who mm -hmm. claimed their mark on our movement. And yep. so I was like, no, it's time for me as a black trans woman to take back my right as a black trans woman, as a human being, as a body in this country. And I deserve and I need the respect and the space to be who I am, to succeed in life, to have those opportunities, to fight for the injustices. And I'm not just talking about society, but I'm talking about the things within the community of color, the racism in the community of color, and the cultural divide that we have, the, the divide and conquer tactics that still separate us to this day, or the fact that there's racism and sexism in the LGBTQIA community. Mm -hmm. And why aren't people hiring trans women? Why are we just fantasizing mm -hmm. that our troubles would get better? So it was so many things, you know, reading about Sylvia Rivera, yeah. and Marsha P. Johnson, and Ms. Yeah. Major, and reading about Asada Shakira, and Huey P. Newton, and mm -hmm. reading my Maya Angelou and things that just grounded me and humbled mm -hmm. me in a way that I knew that this struggle hasn't just started. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the first black body in a cage. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the first trans woman, you know, prosecuted for defending herself. Mm -hmm. I'm not the first woman to be prosecuted for defending herself. Mm -hmm. And all these things that are flooding my mind, I'm like, this is my journey. I think this is what my calling is. And mm -hmm. When the incident happened and I got the news that I was being charged with murder, like I said, I was depressed. I didn't want to have nothing to do with anything. My life was just pretty much in shambles. Mm -hmm. And it took people to show me again that there's, there's life and there's hope mm -hmm. and there's you know, aspirations and, th and that I live through people and people live through me and that that pushed me to have the motivation and the audacity because that's what they don't want from black people. That's what yep. they don't want from uh, trans and queer and gender nonconforming people is the audacity to mm -hmm. live. And like I said, fuck that, I'm going to live even mm -hmm. if that means fighting the system and what yep. that means to fight the system. And yep. so that encouraged me. I learned about, you know, the government and how that was set up and knowing the history of the prison industrial complex and its evolution from slavery and again, mm -hmm. caging black bodies and the profit of black bodies. And so I'm like, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to give them a reason. I'm going to make sure that I don't 
give in. You know what I'm saying? As I'm coming undone, I need to put myself back together and I need to show them that I am a strong black trans woman and you will not just use me and dispose me because I'm not disposable. So I'm going to fight this for as long as I have to. Mm. And that's what I did. Wow. <laughs> well, right on. All right. So that answered like four of my other questions. <laughs> So now, actually, I think it's something that I think many people in this room, and myself included, are curious about beyond your case, like what was your childhood and teenage years like? And what was it like coming of age as queer in Chicago? Um, when I was 14, I had the ultimatum of living at home in, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure people heard this, the motto from their parents, you live under my roof, you live by my rules. So mm -hmm. I was so much of a rebel, I felt like I, that was my mother's um, somewhat pink washing of me. Like I couldn't be myself, I couldn't live in my transness in her household and I decided that well, I would take my chances in life and stay true to who I am than to feel like I have to conform. Mm. And that's what that, like I didn't know what conformity was, but I knew that what people wanted from me is not what they were gonna get mm -hmm. or what they expected. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I packed my things and I left. I left late that night because, um, It was like me tricking my mom. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here or whatever. And then I just packed my stuff because I knew eventually she wouldn't have let me left and I would have been in an environment that was unhealthy for me, both spiritually and mentally. And so I just replaced myself out of that. And that's when I learned to, uh, I mean, at that point in my life, I was somewhat kind of street savvy, I would say. I, you know, I wasn't going to school anymore uh, because of the fear of re rejection and having to deal with the um, discrimination. Um, and before I stopped going to school, I got into an altercation with another, with another student. And, um, he was just, you know, disrespecting me, and I hit him with a chair. And so <laughs> I was, I was really mad. I was angry back then, and and I mean, I'm, I'm upset that it got to that level. But I also have to understand that I had the right to be upset. I had the right to feel angry that people didn't allow me to be who I was, and I was subject to other other people's hate towards me for me being who I wanted to be and who I was. And so I had an ultimatum, ultimatum of going to um, boot camp or an alternative school. And then, yeah, I manipulated that too. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna pick. And then I was like, fuck school. I, <laughs> I'll figure it out in life, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I began sex work and stealing and doing what I had to do for survival. And I learned that from a lot of my queer family in Chicago, the people who kind of showed me the ropes of the street. We had like a safety system for the ones who did sex work. And like, we all had a spot that we would make sure that if we do it, you get picked up here. So the girls know that you're here and make sure that you get dropped off here. So we can, you know, have regroup and make sure that we're all together and safe and like it's dark and, and late and things can happen. So I learned how to have, you know, someone's back and learn to trust somebody again. But I was constantly still being jaded by society and so like I was mad still. So I was just like an angry, punk, rebel, homeless, radical kid, I guess, and just 
you know, that kind of grew with me. I never really was an activist on a level that I didn't go outside of self-advocating or like advocating for the people in my circle. But like I've always been a person that was about finding justice for people or like helping people and being cautious and in tune with the people around me and the world in general. Mm -hmm. And I at the age of 18, I moved to Minneapolis, and then that's when I was able to start my hormone treatments. Because I felt like if I started transitioning while I was in Chicago, um, that it would have some effect on my family, mm -hmm. and me and my family, and our relationship. With, not that it was really one there to begin with, but still, I still was trying to decolonize my mind uh, from all the religious extremism bullshit that they in place mm -hmm. in me. And so like, I'm like, if they feel like, you know, I'm a threat to their Christianity, then I'm just gonna fucking move around. So mm -hmm. I ended up moving to Minnesota and I started transitioning. And that's when I were, you know, I did my first panel there. And I had read, uh, written something about, you know, my experience in school as, you know, as a, as a queer teen, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I was still homeless. I was still meeting people, learning, you know, learning about life. And uh, for me, a lot of my ideas, my encouragement, my motivation, aspirations, and dedication to activism came like close to when I got um, in prison. But, you know, in school or in life in general, people don't give you the education, the real education you need, mm -hmm. like the systematic bullshit that keeps us oppressed, like you're not gonna learn that in elementary school. Like, mm. you know, like. <laughs> True that, yep. <laughs> Yellow, that spells prison industrial complex. Like you don't have <laughs> those things in elementary school. Mm. So I'm like learning all of this new stuff as I'm growing older and, you know, getting involved with people who kind of opened me up to that. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of what gave me the motivation to, you know, be more into the activist work and learn about the things that oppress us and how to abolish them. Word. Stay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so next question. The suicide of trans teenager Leela Acorn made headlines late last year uh, after she stepped out onto oncoming traffic along Interstate 71 near her home in Ohio. We heard about her story quite a bit in the news and even during the Golden Globes like award telecasts. Why do you think her story made the news whereas a number of trans women of color who have been killed such as Islan Nettles or, um, excuse me, apologize for mispronouncing the name potentially, Taha de, la, um, de Cruz, mm -hmm. um, excuse me, de Jesus, here in the Bay Area have not received the same attention? Oh, you're talking about Taja? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I was talking about this earlier, and again, if people know me, I'm really unapologetic, and so shit gets real when I start talking. So this is some real shit. That I'm <laughs> no, this is <laughs> serious. So there's this um, in society, there is the appropriation of black people. And so we live in a world where when a white person, when something happens to a white person is seen uh, more intense, like that, that issue is more um, important now because it happened to a white person. If we look at everything from the outbreak of Ebola to Lila Acorn, those things have already existed in life. Black people have been going through those things since, since uh, 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 Columbus, Col what's his name? Columbus landed on, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever his name is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's like, <laughs> the, like, these things have been happening. Mm -hmm. And it's just the visibility of trans women is happening because had that happened, 
probably five, ten years ago, no one would have cared. Wouldn't even made any type of media outlet, mm -hmm. let alone the Oscars, which is also a white dominant arena mm -hmm. where you know all they care about are things that are related to white people. So it's mm -hmm. like that was going to happen anyways. Um, but I guess there was also the idea of seeing that trans is now a trend and so they wanted to profit off of that. They felt mm -hmm. like, oh, if we can get as many likes as we can off of someone else's sorrows, then mm -hmm. hey, why not profit off of that? That was just for profit or gain. They didn't mm -hmm. really care about, they just said, hey, if we can get trans people to feed into our bullshit, then why not? Let's just use this person as a way to trap people into our capitalist ideas. But mm -hmm. I just feel like it was a it was a ploy. Like there haven't been any media attention to uh, any of the eight trans women that have been killed this year alone. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that idea of using one trans person to represent a body of trans women was unlikely when there have been so many trans women that have been murdered, who have been slain, who have been taken from us, that still have been misgendered, have been misrepresented, have been uh, let down in the media, mm -hmm. and they use the, you know, the one avenue that they could take, which is the, you know, the trans, white teenager who was in sorrow and how can we profit off of that mm. right. so follow up to that what do you think it will take to end violence against trans communities throughout the world do you think this violence that happens on the street is connected to how trans people are discriminated against by laws and the government which cause such high rates of unemployment and lack of health care etc Um, well, I feel like for trans women, we're constantly being subjected to stereotypes and we're constantly being subjected to violence. And we have people who claim to be allies and claim to stand in solidarity, but they don't hire us. They keep us oppressed. They fail to listen to our issues. They hire white people. A trans man for black trans positions. They ask us, how do you feel and steal shit on our rainbows? They take away our dreams, they steal our ideas, they profit off of our pain, and I feel like there's so much cultural divide in the intersections that are connected with trans violence from, you know, the prison industrial complex to uh, racism, uh, poverty, uh, the demonization of trans bodies, uh, uh, hypersexualization, uh, what else? Um, those things and so many other are common factors to the violence of trans women. We look at the prison, uh, I mean, the medical industrial complex who really don't give fucks about the trans community. They only do what they feel they have to do. It's not that they're doing it because they see genuinely us as one humans who deserve medicine, mm -hmm. any type, that be ibuprofen, mm -hmm. or the fact that um, there is so much sexism that is um, within the med medical industrial complex. Um, I was just saying yesterday how trans women have to uh, jump through fiery hoops and fight lions and uh, tigers and bears and you know just to get her hormones and a man could get a penis bump on the drop of a dime and so like I was it's really important that we talk about the issues that are surrounded around trans violence because trans violence is more than something that is physical something that is actually happening to us trans violence are the things that are perpetuating trans violence so that's when you're not hiring us when you're giving us no avenues to have space when you're taking our space away from us when you're pushing us out into dangerous environments where you're pushing us into uh, predicaments where we have to deal with uh, shitty fiscal sponsors and you know the mainstreamness of gay and lesbian have kind of uh, encroached 
on trans people's faces. And so now trans, trans people are fighting for the things. It's just like when Sylvia Rivera stepped on that stage and told that crowd that she wasn't just doing it for the gay people, that she was doing it for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so when trans people are trying to do that and people act like they care and they constantly push us out mm -hmm. and take our space and take our resources and then say, hey, instead of hiring hiring you trans friend, I'm gonna hire my best friend who's this and straight and does, does not do shit for trans people or know anything about trans people and especially trans women of color and trans women of color are constantly trying to figure out how to do these things by themselves and then we deal with the violence of society we're pushed out we're like cubs being left by you know their mom and we're you know having to survive on our own and that's and that's what it's like and they're and not even just that when it comes to physical violence towards trans women it's because the unawareness of trans people people see us as disposable so it's easy for our people who have no soul as people who see us as robots or as props to just you know feel like hey nobody would care if I I shot you the fuck right here because no one cares. People don't even probably know who you are or what you are or, you know, they're not going to care. So that's, that's, when that is living in society, then of course there's always going to be violence towards trans women. And as long as people are unaware and uneducated about that, it's going to continue. And as long as people are crouching on trans people's faces, that's going to continue. So there's so many questions I want to ask, but I also want to make sure we have time to open it up. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Could you say something about the Black Lives Matter movement and how this struggle is, um, how this is connected to your struggle? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, excuse me, it's the seltzer water. Um, <laughs> I have been speaking about this a lot on the strength of the unacknowledgement of the cis black community. Okay, so first off, why hasn't no one acknowledged the fact that Black Lives Matter, hashtag Black Lives Matter, the whole campaign has been founded by queer black women? Mm -hmm. Why is it that we're using uh, one specific uh, genre of black person to represent the death of black people. Why is it that we're just marching for uh, uh, black men, black cis men of color and not marching for uh, trans women of color who have been murdered, who are also black? I feel like there's a large separation from people or how about the fact that cis women of color get shot the same time as a cis black man by a cop? Why isn't nobody talking about that? Why aren't we marching for the lives of all people who are black? And I feel like there has been some type of separation of uh, struggle within the, that campaign. Like uh, people have taken that and used it only for a specific person that has been Yes, oppressed by society through police brutality, through, uh, you know, the ideas of black people then being disposable. But we have to understand, black isn't just cis and straight. Black is queer. Black is trans. Black is um, gender nonconforming. Black is everything. Mm -hmm. So how can we just use that for one specific thing and not use it for all lives who are black? That's what it's, that's what it's saying. Black lives matter. So you're saying that because I'm trans that my blackness isn't as important. That's fucked up. That's, and that's a lie. Mm -hmm. Because if anybody goes back to my case, the same night that I was called a tranny, I was called a nigger. So people need to understand my blackness is just as important as my transness. Mm -hmm. And and it could be both ways for me. There's no separation for me. Only when I know that, oh, this, this, this particular situation is you know, dealing with me being trans or this situation is dealing with me being black. But just know that that happens, that I have to pick these things, that I have separation and I have to put, 
things together for myself as a black trans woman. Like, I am not just trans. I am not just black. I am those things. Mm -hmm. And they can either be together or separate, but I deal with those. You know what I'm saying? So I always tell people also, like, white people, stop, like, um, trying to compare your struggles to those of people of color. We understand that you go through what we go through, but as a person of color, if you're homeless, your homelessness could have been saved because you would have been able to get in the shelter nine times more likely than I would have. People would have turned me around only on the strength that I was black or only on the strength that I was trans. So try and imagine those things being put together. Living in society where all of those things are demonized, are criminalized, are hypersexualized when they are looked down upon. So I'm constantly telling people like, look, we have to respect people's struggles, but don't try to appropriate your whiteness on me because I don't give two shits because you still have white privilege. You still can navigate this society without those issues and I still have to deal with being black. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, so don't just stand here and say, you know, because you marched at a, a Black Lives Matter march for Trayvon Martin or Mike Brown or for Eric Garner that you did something with yourself. Because at the end of the day, you still get to leave here and be white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's so many questions. All right, <laughs> but you can still throw back. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit more. All right. So today is International Women's Day, and it was first called in 1910 at the Second International Conference of Working Women. It was inspired by the struggle of women workers in the U.S., particularly textile workers in New York City. Um, we've come a long way as we've have this meeting on trans liberation on International Women's Day. Why do you think the history of this day isn't widely known, such as the history of the creation of Black History Month? Mm. Well, let's just be honest, Black History Month isn't that acknowledged either, so I mm. mean, it, but anyways, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True um, I feel like, uh, when it comes to the struggles, the resiliency, the power of women, it's always going to look down upon by the, the hyper-masculine egos and ideologies of masculine identities. And, and it, just, it doesn't come from just cis men, it comes from trans men too sometimes that can be encroaching on, you know, the feminist uh, movement and just knowing that me being a woman, you know, I have to educate myself on those movements that women have led. And when you think of all the movements, they have been led by women. And so, like, men are constantly taking credit for the things that women have been doing. And that's when we see that femininity is demonized and is looked down upon and is considered to be the leaser or weak. And it's um, really... Uh, devastating to see that women aren't getting the credit and the due that we deserve, seeing that a lot of uh, important uh, female role models, leaders, um, activists, teachers have been women and most of them women of color. So it's like we, we have to um, really think about how we value women and feminine uh, entities in the the whole feminine spectrum in general um, and also we as women have to learn to appreciate and stick up for each other like we have a lot of women who have the ideologies of men through uh, through conformity and think you know when you think at think of the war on women, you have a lot of female politicians that are also banging their gavels in agreement with men when it comes to the sterilization of women. Or when we think about how the, the, the woman's struggle is 
connected to industrial complexes from slut shaming to sterile sterilization in prisons. It's like those things are very effective to the growth of women and they try to oppress us in any way. So I think that's why there is no acknowledgement for women in the light of other mainstream cultures because um, again, even in black history, there is male dominance. Mm -hmm. And so when we take away, you know, even with the anniversary of Selma being today, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of male dominance in that movement too. Mm -hmm. Like there was a lot of, you know, sexist and um, sexism in within those leaders who felt like that was their role to to be, you know, the all-powering man. And it's like, no, women are just as strong. Women fight just as harder. You know, women stand longer and stronger. We put in the work and we are not getting the respect mm -hmm. and the acknowledgement for that. And so when, when we think about uh, women, Women's International Day being one day, that is the condensation of our cultures again. You know, like, when I said that Black History Month isn't really acknowledged as a month, that's because I say we really don't talk about really powerful black leaders. We only talk about the ones that everybody knows about, that everybody was taught about in back going to grammar school again. Like, everybody knows about Malcolm X and... Um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., but what about Asada Shakur? What about mm -hmm. Huey P. Newton? What about uh, Mumia uh, uh, Jamal? Uh, what about the people who have struggled, who are still in prison to this day? What about the people who have fought and died in prisons? What about the people who have been shot and killed by police through this movement? And, mm -hmm. you know, it was just condensed down to, you know, Madam C.J. Walkers and people not saying that they weren't prominent and that they created history. But what about the radical leaders? They don't want to teach you about the radical leaders. They don't want to incite your mind. They don't want you to feel like you there. There is a way to beat the system that there were people who kind of set this in place for us. So all all of our struggles have been condensed in some way. But by femininity being the lesser, the weaker, then it is condensed down as far as it can because women are strong in by us leading most major movements. They don't want that type of uprising. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the last question for now, for me at least. <laughs> uh, so there's been a lot of discussion right now about what it will take to build a movement for liberation of the oppressed and working poor in this country. What do you think is the role of solidarity and joint collective struggle in connecting the many fights we have to wage right now? Because there's a lot of work to do. Yes. Um, well, of course, there definitely needs to be acknowledgement of privilege and ignorance and unawareness in our movements. If you're in a, okay, this is, this is deep. Because this is really deep, because I was saying this yesterday. Allyship and solidarity are more than words. I feel like when somebody said that solidarity was for white women, they really hit it on the head, and I'm gonna say this. When you as a white person call yourself an ally to a person of color. There is not enough hipster blood in your body to make you feel that by saying that you're standing with me and you can go around your side friends and appropriate, appropriate blackness that you can uh, allow fascism and bigotry to still exist within your realm and then you don't challenge that and then you come back in my face and then you say power to the people i feel like that's a slap in the face that's like a knife in the back and i feel like you're pretending that's not allyship if you're a cis person and you can go around your side friends and you can allow the fascism and the bigotry to be in that space, if you hear your friends disrespecting trans women, disrespecting women, period, and you don't challenge that, 
You're a pretender. You're not standing in solidarity with anyone but your ego. And to romanticize and fantasize the ideas of you know, things getting better. And like I said, you're constantly encrouching and being overwhelming in our spaces and you're taking our resources and you're not giving us the space to grow and to figure out how to end our cultural divides when you're constantly using your sexism and racism and your privilege in my space where I'm not able to, you know, attack the system the way that I need to, both individually and collectively, I'm not going to be able to give that 100%. And I know that a lot of people feel like that. A lot of people won't be able to focus or, you know, the fear of having to, you know, be rejected or um, dealing with organizations that don't want to you know, work collectively. I know that a lot of people have been bullied out of organizations by white trans men. And this is supposed to be a, a, a trans space for people of color. And, you know, or gay and lesbian, white, cis people running any trans organization, period. And you're not giving us the right to survival, you're not giving us the means we need to survive. And we're constantly struggling. And we talk about, oh, we're all equal. There's gonna be, it's gonna get better. Everything is fine. And it's like, no, it's not fucking fine. It's not okay. It's not all right. We need to be hired. We need to have the opportunities that a lot of people have been given and that has been stripped away from us. You know what I'm saying? And so, again, like, to come together, to think about any type of liberative movement, those things need to be challenged. The racism, the sexism, the, uh, the misogyny, the trans misogyny, the cultural divide, the uneducation, the, the colonization of our minds from what we've been taught in life in general. All those things affect the way, what we bring into a space where other people are working because me personally, I don't want to work with pretenders. I don't, wanna, I don't want somebody to be in my face saying they're an activist and, you know, <laughs> This is just a lot. If you're a person that's really, truly standing in solidarity, if you're really, truly a person who cares about the struggles of trans women of color, queer women, people of color, if you're somebody that is really a person that is truly looking for a liberative and progressive movement in that, then put aside your egotistical bullshit and do what is supposed to be done. If you're a person like myself who wants to connect with people, then take those chances, take those risks because, you know, one, I, my motto for this year is like, fuck your feelings. I have to tell it how it is. If we are really gonna make this work, I can coax to your ego and make you feel like just because you bake some fucking cookies for this March that you did a fucking good job. No, there are people who are losing their homes, their families, their freedom, their lives for this movement and we just act like, oh, I showed up for this march. I'm so cool and you're posting it on Facebook trying to get as many likes as you can get and it's like the movement isn't about your fucking likes. The movement is about liberation. The movement is about progressiveness. The movement is about making sure that everybody is living in equality and justice. And because you feel like you can post a picture on Instagram of all the people that showed up to a march and then you leave and you go sit on your fucking futon and you're watching your fucking flag screen and you're eating your hummus. 
And there are people who don't have homes to go to, who don't fucking have any job to rely on, who are living in shelters, who are living on the streets and doing the same fucking thing that you're doing and you want to fucking pat on the back? No. You need to be patting the people who work hard, who are losing their lives, who are losing their homes, who are losing their jobs. Those are the people who are putting in the work. So if you feel like you're going to get a kudos from me because you fucking showed up, well, fuck your feelings. <laughs> All right, and on that note... <laughs> We're going to go ahead in a second and go to the question and answer space. So I'm going to describe how that's going to work in just a second. But real quick, there's a couple of things that I just want to point out. One, there's going to, in order to have this, this is a fundraiser for CC. Um, we are going to be passing buckets around in a second. So put in what you can. We appreciate that. And also that we're, great, we're grateful to have this space, but it also does cost money too. So buckets will be going around if you can please put in what you can. Um, the other thing is that there's an, this is a meeting that's been put on with the International Socialist Organization and we're gonna have a, <laughs> we're gonna have a quick um, announcement and then we're gonna go ahead into the Q&A and I'll explain that in a second. So, yes, go Diana. Thank you, Diana. So what we're going to do now is that there are going to be index cards that are going to be going around. And basically, if you have a question or a comment that you want to say, you can write it on those cards. And then we're going to gather them up here and we're going to sort them through. And then basically with that, every few questions or comments that are out, um, then CC will come back and respond to them. And if you want, some, if you want me to read it, then just say you read it. And if you want to 
read it, then you'll say, I read it. And then you can just come on up to the mic here. So we're gonna get some of those going and just going around now. And basically the way it's gonna work, if you come up to the mic, we're gonna give you starting out about two minutes. There's a lot of people in this room and I'm sure that people are gonna to wanna to speak up and ask things. So if you have questions or things like that, try to get them out as early as possible. So grab one of those cards. If you feel like you may need to say something but you're not sure yet, take a card. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. And pretty much, again, we're gonna, the way we kind of work, it's um, a progressive stack. So we're gonna make sure that there's a multitude of questions and speakers and being able to actually speak. So, all right, I'm gonna go ahead with that in just a minute. So once you're done filling out your card, you can give them back to the people who are, who were handing out the cards. It's gonna be a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> the first one and it's just thank you for speaking out <laughs> yes agreed <laughs> you can go ahead all right so we got our first question or uh, first of all thank you that I created for capital, capitalist gain is really hard because they try to profit off of the things that everyday people are trying to hold dear to them. Like they profit off of, you know, March for Dimes. They profit off of uh, cancer research. They profit off of homeless people. And they say that, oh, if you donate to our cause, we'll give 5% back to these organizations. And it's like, ah, uh -uh, you, you are worth a hundred trillion gazillion dollars. Like, why are you only giving 5%? And so we're like constantly um, having people who don't care about these issues, people who are really self, you know, selfish and self-centered and, you know, brainwashed by capitalist ideas and what the major market wants us to do is buy their crap. And so like 
um, people don't understand that. Like you have people who just buy to be buying things, you know, you, and then you have people who buy to survive, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's why I try to steal as much because it's like, I'm not going to pay for something. Why would I pay you $12 for some pants and you're like worth a hundred gazillion dollars? And it's like, <laughs> maybe I should just put this in my purse. No, I'm just saying, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> but um, I feel like we have to get people to see that these uh, major institutions and um, industrial complexes are profiting off of our lives. Everything we do when we're being taxed, the profit of that is going to prisons. When we are being uh, built at restaurants, a part of that is aided to the school to prison pipeline. So it's like, you know, they, on the surface, you know, give you what you want or they feed you this bullshit on the surface. Like, hey, if you buy my stuff, you know, we'll give back to this cause that I'm pretty sure your sweet little heart is so concerned about and they're so evil about it that they don't care. But under the surface, underneath that, what they kind of, you know, put as a distraction. The things that are underneath, like the things that they do profit of, like the prison industrial complex, which Walmart is one of them, mm. are constantly taken from us. And it's kind of like, oh, see, stupid, I, I tricked you. You know what I'm saying? But people don't know that. When you have people who support the prison industrial complex or are unaware of, of how detrimental it is, then it's like where they where the money goes after they spend it, they don't care. They just looking for the material thing that they can have in that moment, and that's how our brains have been, uh, you know, brainwashed to buy things. Don't care about nothing else. Just buy them, buy them, buy them, and keep buying them. And don't look this way. Don't look at the people suffering. Don't look at the people hurting. Don't look at the people who are being deported. Don't look at the people who are being in prison. Don't look at the people who are being killed. Mm -hmm. Buy this hamburger. <laughs> Thank you. So there are a lot of questions coming up. So I'm gonna try my best to go through and make sure, so trust me, I'm trying. Um, I'm gonna read a couple off and then you can come back and we can try to work through some of this. Okay. All right, so the next question is, the first one is, uh, do you feel that police uh, prisons and or the state should be abolished? And then, thank you. <laughs> and then the next question is, how did solidarity play a role in the campaign to release you from prison? So those two okay. questions. So definitely, prisons, police, industrial complexes, hate, sexism, all these systematic, systematical uh, oppressive regimes need to be abolished. I mean, there's no need for them to exist. These are the things that keep people from um, thinking outside the box and being able to achieve the potentials that we were supposed to achieve as humans, but we've been dumbed down, we've been poisoned, and we've been bamboozled, and we have accepted that for so long, and it's hard when, when, when people have internalized that and can't let it go. Mm -hmm. So for the people who actually see these things as problems, when you know, for outsiders, we're looked at as conspiracy theorists, like, oh, you're just crazy. And it's like, no, I'm not crazy. Like this stuff is really happening. But because you don't care, because you have been brainwashed, because you live your cis hetero normal life, mm -hmm. because you live with your white privilege, mm -hmm. you don't see these things and these things don't exist to you, but they exist. And like, how do we abolish these things? How do we allow people to see like, oh, cops aren't really, you know, made to protect you. You know, cops used to be slave owners. Mm -hmm. Like, let's talk about these things. Like, what is the purpose of a cop? To protect and serve? No, they're here to destroy and, de and, uh, and deceive. It's like, 
their job is exactly what it's meant to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. And I believe that was the same motto for the devil. And so, like, <laughs> and so I'm believing that people believe that there's no need for cops if we allow us to handle our situations within our own space, if we constantly allow, um, you know, the space to give them that authority because we still give them that authority. We People in society give them that hierarchy. They say, hey, I'm trusting you with my life and they take that shit to heart, but they don't care about the only, you know, the other people who expect them to protect and help them. They only protect and help the people they were supposed to protect, which was the white rich people. Mm -hmm. And they're still protecting the white rich people. Mm -hmm. And so like, their job, again, is to do exactly what it was supposed to do, was to keep, you know, non-conforming people of color uh, in, in check, to get rid of them, to dispose of them, and to keep, you know, this idea that they're the knight in shiny armor, and it's like, no, that's not your duty. <laughs> So just a little bit with the other question. Oh, it was the second question. Uh, the second question was, how did Solidarity play a role in the campaign to uh, release you from prison? Um, I, uh, well, mostly of what I talk about is the collectiveness of people, of people from different races and cultural backgrounds, because that's exactly what it was. In my case, um, the people who came together for the CC Support Committee were people who did not know each other before the CC Support Committee. They just seen that there was an injustice in their main focus was the injustice, not the shit that they had going on for themselves. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like people bringing their own ideologies into this space that would have probably caused some type of conflict or confusion in the movement. And that's what made the movement so strong because they put aside the things that they view or their personal ideas and they use that as a motivating force to come together to fight for what the injustice was. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I say about like organizations and groups and people in general collectively working together once we put aside our own egotistical bullshit to fight for something greater then that's when shit can really get done. Okay, so the next question, um, the person's gonna read it, uh, Zoe? So all right. Yes, um, well, actually, probably. sorry. Well, um, Zoe's coming up. We're gonna, the next question, um, and you can answer it after. Well, actually, we'll just wait. You go. Here. <laughs> Um, okay, so again, like, one is to pay trans women to tell you their stories. <laughs> like, these colleges, these colleges, these colleges are also a part of the industrial complex and profiting off of black bodies through the prison industrial complex. And so I feel like um, a college that is annually getting a hundred million dollars a year can pay a trans woman to research her for her everyday life or her struggles. And I feel like, again, with the appro appropriation of black bodies, especially trans black bodies and the, the romantic, romantic uh, 
romanticization and fantasization of trans bodies and the ideas that, you know, it's interesting. I want to pick your brain. I want to know everything about you. And then you're showing us again that you're disposable because it's like, okay, thank you for opening your heart up, reopening those wounds up. Thank you so much for just sharing your soul. Now, good day. And it's like, no, 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 honey. I'm not going to leave here if I can't pay my rent. You finna pay my rent. You finna tell me something. You, uh, my phone bill is due. So I didn't just come here and share my story with you. And you, again, get to go sit on your futon and eat your Grey Poupon turkey club sandwich. No, I, I need to pay my bills. But also, I feel like the acceptance and acknowledgement and showing that you genuinely care about trans issues are a way to get, once you build trust with trans people, don't ever break that because trans people have been through a lot in society and it's easy to scar us and it's easy to let us down and it's easy for you to jade us. And once we're jaded and bitchy, it's not cute because then that's when we're trying to figure out how to get get you back. And like, that's not what we want. We want to, we want to work with people, but again, people are constantly using their privilege as a way to manipulate us and, and uh, show us that, you know, thank you for giving me your resources. Thank you for giving me everything that I needed, but I can't do anything for you. And it's like, well, how am I going to survive? How am I going to live? You know what I'm saying? So when you think about trans women and their struggles, and if you want to know about trans women and their struggles, well, help trans women with their struggles, because that's what's important. All right, so two more questions. Well, we still got many more questions, but the next two. Uh, one, hashtag trans lives matter, and how that hashtag may highlight or detract from the black trans community. And then the second question, HRC didn't support your campaign. Al Sharpton does not support Black Lives Matter. Is this just a generational divide? Um, for the first question, um, I feel like Trans Lives Matter, again, is just selectively separating specific people that have been affected by uh, some form of oppression. And that's usually, you know, trans women. But what about trans men that have been affected by some form of violence, some form of police brutality, some form of injustice? And so again, we're leaving people out of something that was created for a, a group largely. And also that Trans Lives Matter didn't get the support that people would have thought it would have got gotten from, you know, like uh, Black Lives Matter. But it definitely celebrates the lives of trans people. I feel like the, I mean, not all of the Lives Matter campaign, not the actual thing, but I'm saying <laughs> all of the lives of people in the Lives Campaign, uh, the Lives Matter campaign, because that should just be the hashtag, the Lives Matter. Like, it shouldn't have any specific thing in the front because then we're, we're deciding who is important enough to be cared about or who, who's important enough to get some type of media attention. So when we say trans people, what type of trans people? Because people don't care about black trans women. We, we see that every day. So it's like, what does that mean to say trans lives matter? What does it mean to say black lives matter? What does it mean to say anybody lives matter? We have to think about how sec seclusionary that can be and like how it's constantly still marginalizing groups and separating people from an overall larger movement. Wait, what was the second question? Yes, sorry. Second question, HRC did not support your campaign. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I figured you'd say that. Uh, then Al Sharpton does, um, does not support Black Lives Matter. Is this just a generational divide? 
Um, I don't know if it's so much a generational divide because there are a lot of people. I think that's almost like being an ageist in a way. Mm -hmm. Saying that an old person couldn't care for my issue or vice versa. No, it's just people who, again, are only looking for their personal gain mm -hmm. and whatever they can get their hands into. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. if the money jar is big enough, that's where the hand is. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like... Um, that idea of generational gap is only due to our lack of educating people, of, of showing them why it's just important to care about this than it is to care about that. Mm -hmm. And so saying that it has anything to do with generations, I think that is a lie because I have met people who have been in their 80s, who have came up to me, didn't try to, you know, appropriate my blackness or mm -hmm. tell me stories about when they were a kid as, you know, being white as a kid in their day. And like, but you have some people who do. Mm -hmm. And so like, I just think it's, it's one's own ignorance and unaware, you know, unawareness of what that means or what that movement is or why we're doing that. Mm -hmm. It's just them only caring about what they want to care about. You know what I'm saying? HRC had all the opportunity in the world to get involved with my case. And they said they didn't want to get involved because it doesn't fit their criteria or whatever the case may be. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and to know that now they're trying to have me come speak for them. And I'm like, well, guess what? I need like $10,000. You want me to come speak for you? I need some money. I need some coin, honey. And then the chances are I'm still going to get there and curse you out. So, like, be prepared for that. <laughs> and it's like, yes. it's like, um, I feel like, again, whatever is for profit, whatever is a trend, whatever they can use as a ploy to get people to pay attention to them is what they'll do. That's like, you know, the lowest of lows that they, you know, they, everything for people, when you think of, you know, Ar uh, what's his name? Al Sharpton. Mm. I was gonna call him Arnold, y'all, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> Mr. Sharpton is a part of an arena that's still for profit. He works on MSNBC, they show commercials, they want you to buy stuff, mm -hmm. they have a set list of things that they have to stick to, just like any news, you know, arena. Um, they're considerably more liberal, but I feel like whatever they can use as a way to get money, HRC didn't get involved with me because I wasn't worth any money. They couldn't find any way to profit off of what I was going through. They couldn't find a way to get people to donate to them if they could have me as something for profit. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just, I, I, I cancel it as being anything that is generational. I just think it's people who care about their own shit and don't care about other people's issues and like even again surfacely the things we see underneath those things are way different and that's where the fucked up shit is mm -hmm. and so that's how we're left with the idea that you know because there's this age gap or this time span between me and this person that we can't unify for the same movement because I've done that with people of all ages from zero to a hundred, so. Mm. Right on, all right, two more questions. Uh, first one, can you talk about the role of self-care and movement building and who are your fave, excuse me, your favorite five prison abolitionists? Mm. Um, so I feel like self-care is 
important because a lot of times we as activists put our all and that's sometimes not even our fault because again we're dealing with pretenders and people who are just there for you know their own self gratification mm -hmm. and so we're putting in extra work and we're dealing with the anxieties of our everyday life on top of being you know fighting these systems and I feel like self care is extremely important um, a lot of us who deal with different type of uh, mental and physical limitations and disabilities and a lot of us who are dealing with being homeless and you know unemployed and things like that where we're constantly stressing about but we're giving a hundred percent in the work that we do um, and I feel like it's important that we take time to have self-awareness, that we give ourselves space to grow, to breathe, to relax and unwind and to love ourselves and understand who we are, um, but also c continue to do the work in the necessary ways that we need to do them. Mm -hmm and not saying that you have to do the things that I do when it comes to activist work, but stay diligent and stay focused in the work that you do, but also make sure that you do have time for yourself um, so that you can um, have love and self-assuredness and self-awareness and, and, and self-centeredness with yourself so that you can be able to have positive and loving energy in the work that you do and still be able to deal with your shitty everyday life but still be positive in that mm -hmm. and have love and have compassion and have understanding and understand and understand that everything that you're going through is not your fault it's the the way that this you know society has been set up mm -hmm. and that's out of our control so to live in that disparity will only uh, give them gratification. It will only say that they've won. And that's why I constantly, even through everything that I go through, I constantly, you know, stay and live through positive energy and self-centeredness and self-awareness and self-love and just being in tune with myself and the people in the world around me. And then the other question was, who are your five, excuse me, your favorite five prison abolitionists? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> so I have Asada Shakir, mm -hmm. Mumi Abu Jamal, mm -hmm. Huey P. Newton, mm -hmm. Miss Major, um, Keegan O'Brien, but I. <laughs> But if people don't know him, then like they're like, who? But um, he's a friend of mine. He's a part of the ISO, too. Um, who else? Um, <laughs> um, pe like people who are unconventional with mm -hmm. like um, prison abolition, like Maya Angelou. Like I feel like a lot of her work spoke to mm -hmm. the undertones of black struggle and black lives in general when it came to the struggle. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like even though a lot of her stuff then speak about prison abolition, the, the celebration of black lives challenged prison abolition, seeing that black people have been confined to that like as in if we were you know that was stamped on our birth certificates like mm -hmm. prison industrial complex you mm -hmm. know so yeah um those are my five favorites <laughs> keegan's good people all right um, so a couple more questions uh well i'm just keep saying that but i'm gonna do two at a time so, on a political level, what will it take to bring transgender, queer, and homosexual issues to the forefront of public debate? And then the second question, if you could anything and everything for your community, what would you want? Um, 
I feel like um, there has been some progressiveness with with visibility, but I feel like visibility isn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, just like I feel like tolerance is a fucked up um, term to use for tr uh, the acceptance of trans people. Like, I don't want you to tolerate me. I don't want you to just put up with me. I want you to understand that I'm alive, that I'm a human, that I have emotions. I don't sleep in a fucking cave upside down. I don't sleep <laughs> in a closet with the power off. I'm a human being. And like, being tolerable of me is just saying, oh, I'm just putting up with you because I have to. And I don't want you to just put up with me because I'm not like your annoying little puppy or something. Like, I'm a person that has to fucking live and survive. And, you know, like, don't just say that, oh, I see you and that's it. Like, I want you to see me, I want you to hear me, I want you to feel me, I want you to know that I'm human, that I'm real, that I, that I exist, that I'm not disposable, that I'm not, you know, your fucking stepping stone, or that I'm not your, you know, idea or fantasy, that I'm somebody real, so don't just fucking tolerate me, fucking love me, fucking accept me, fucking understand me. Like, don't just say, oh, you're there. Mm. Okay. Because it's more than that. Mm. Wait, what was this? What? <laughs> so the second question was, if you could, um, anything and everything for your community, what would you want? Um, I feel like, of course, I would want us to not have to wake up and hear the lies of trans women of color uh, being murdered, nor do I want us to just celebrate trans lives when we're murdered. Like, why don't we celebrate trans lives now while we're alive and while we're thriving and while we're doing shit in the world? Like, don't wait till we're dead to be like, oh, they were a wonderful person or, oh, like, People can do that now. And also, again, like, stop just romanticizing and fantasizing that things will get better. Like, hire us. Mm -hmm. Fucking give us the space that we need to run our organizations. Don't encroach on our space. Don't take that away from us. Using your privilege to get all up in our shit. Like, that's wrong. And I feel like, you know, it's really important to respect trans women in a light of knowing that we struggle every day and we don't need someone trying to have that savior mentality. Mm -hmm. Like we don't need you to save us. We just want you to help us or, you know, like don't give us that bullshit about, you know, throw me a pity party because I've been there and done that. I don't need that. I need the space, I need the funds, I need the resources and like, you know, while you're saying, oh, I'm sorry about what you're going through, but you're like cording all the shit over here, you're like, okay, I'm sorry, but don't look over here. Mm. Like, that shit, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's annoying. So like, help us if you really care, then care and help us and stop taking our space. Stop taking our resources, stop, you know, giving that position in the trans organization to your straight cis friend. When there are trans women who are still homeless and unemployed and still have to deal with, you know, society's discrimination towards trans women and being passable or being, you know, able to work in that environment and not have to deal with the discrimination. So, yeah, just give us the space so that we can thrive and succeed in life. Mm -hmm. All right, so these next two questions, both people are going to read them. Uh, Kim D, if Kim D is still here, if you can come on up, and then Alessandra. Kim D here. 
Okay, well, if you're sick of time, go ahead. Hi, Susie. Hi. Um, How's it going? Good. Good. Um, so, I think one thing that kind of roots out pretenders, but also builds trust, is actually people that actually gain and struggle. So, it's not just coming to one demonstration, if you actually like help plan a demonstration, mm -hmm. you're there, then that actually, that's not just someone that's pretending. So, I guess one of the things that my question is, is to build trust, um, what are some concrete demands, or just maybe like one thing that people can work on where um, the trans movement and the Black Lives Matter movement can actually come together and actually bond better so that we can actually um, build those bonds of trust, but also actually win something that benefits everybody? Um, I feel like. It will actually be something that is out of those people's control because there are going to be times where you're going to be challenged outside of your black or queer or trans friends that you have to prove where your solidarity and your allyship lie with those people. Just because, you know, you're my friend or you're my ally or you stand in solidarity with me doesn't mean that you're going to encounter a situation that is predominantly cis and white and they're you know being disrespectful or discriminatory or uh, bigoted or fascist towards a marginal marginalized oppressed group what are you going to do about that are you going to walk away from that situation and say, oh, I didn't, I didn't know how to approach that situation or I think that this situation is out of my, you know, I can't do anything with that. When there are people who, like myself, don't have those options because I'm going to face them anyway. You know what I'm saying? But again, where is your acknowledgement with your privilege and how you're utilizing that to benefit? Uh, benefit those uh, people that you claim that you stand in solidarity or have some allyship with. So it's some things that are, it's not so much more a demand that I can make or that people can make because no matter how much we scream and, and yell and say the things that we need, they're not really going to be met unless people have some type of self-acknowledgement, some type of self-awareness about their own privileges and how they use them and how they utilize those to help people of color, to help the LGBTQIA community, to help oppress the marginalized groups. What, how are you asserting your privilege in a way that's beneficial for the people that you claim that you're standing in solidarity with? Does that answer it? Kind of. Um, to know each other, to love each other, to respect each other. If you can, if you can honestly say that you understand who I am as a person, because there is no tangible thing that we can bring forth to each other, like incense or myrrh or whatever, <laughs> and say, hey, like let's let's put this together like it's, it's about our connection with each other our connection with each other on a level that's more vulnerable and more understanding to each other so because you don't see my issues surfacely that you see my issues underneath the things that are really bugging me the things that i cry at night about the things that i'm fighting so hard for and the same thing with you i would want to do that with you i would want to know like who you are as a person like what are the things that you really want to fight for what are the things that we connect with what are your ideas of prison abolition compared to mine? How do we assimilate with each other on a more deeper and vulnerable level where we can just sit down and connect with each other and really break down barriers that are more surface than they are in depth to who we are individu individually to come together? Because we're still culturally divided, regardless of how 
strong our our determination is for prison abolition if i don't know you and you don't know me then we're disconnected we're still segregated mentally and spiritually and like how do we connect on a level that's not you know that's respecting each other's spaces but not um appropriating each other's struggles or uh or you know just surfacely saying I, I care about what you're going through it, compared to me actually knowing who you are and really saying like I understand what you're going through I want to know more like what are the things that are a part of this and figuring those things out together you know what I'm saying there are strength in numbers and the more that we become like one then that's how we because that makes us more united. That makes us stronger than us being like, hey, we're just standing next to each other and we're walking because we're, you know, fighting for the same thing. But if we're mentally and spiritually connected in a way that is deeper, where we can march together and be kind of thinking the same thing and be fighting for the same thing on the same conscious level, then that is more in depth and more in tune with a more radical liberal movement. All right, so we have about six more questions and we're gonna go ahead and read through them. And then we're gonna hear a little bit from our co-sponsors and then I'm gonna ask CC one last question after that. So I'm gonna go ahead and read a couple more questions. All right. And, all right, I'm gonna try to get through. All right, so what disparities did you face during your incarceration as not only a woman of color, but a trans woman of color compared to other inmates, queer or straight? That's the first question. Uh -huh. Second question, do you have any opinions about the racial makeup of this room? Yes. <laughs> Um, so I guess for me, um, I was the only trans person in my unit and I was surrounded by, um, mostly cis, straight, heterosexual men and I dealt with a lot of hypersexualization of my body, so I guess that was the first thing that was, um, negative, um, I dealt with uh you know them trying to uh make me conform to the ideas of society by trying to make me hate myself as a trans woman and uh dealing with um a lot of uh hyper masculinity and um I guess I had to be a lot more assertive in that field to let them know that because I'm a woman, that I'm not weak, be, you know, that because I'm a trans woman of color, that I'm not subjected to your appropriation of my blackness or the ideas that because I'm trans, I have to deal with your sexism and your misogyny, your trans misogyny. Um, I was really outspoken, so I was, really non-caring about the way they felt about me. I just navigated through that the best way that I could. Um, it was really difficult being the only trans person, queer person, any LGBTQIA person in that unit in dealing with, you know, hyper-masculinity, and uh, bigotry and sexism in, in that on top of being oppressed, on top of being incarcerated. So it's like, it was definitely hard, but I, I felt like my strength and the motivation of other people kept me really in tune and humbled with myself. And I stayed true to who I was 
And even in the inside, I fought against the system and they didn't like that and they don't want people to fight against the system from the inside because that is actually where it would start to crumble. Mm. It's within those walls and they have that fear of that uprising in prisons and, mm -hmm. and how that would happen. So I was really monitored because I was like the only trans person, but I was like, you know, I'm fearful of things at that point. I'm like coming up to people like, hey, you want to hear about the industrial complex, the prison industrial complex? You want to know why you're in here? It's so, it's so weird. I will tell you why you're in here. And they're like, <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 I'm so serious. Like, please don't be afraid of me. I know I'm trans. I know this is weird. No, I'm not trying to like suck your dick. Like, just listen to me. Please, please just listen to me like this is some real stuff and they like really listen to me and I like made those connections with people that I probably would have never made connections with but I had to think outside the box and not live on those stereotypes that mm -hmm. society had placed on them. Mm -hmm. Especially being around a lot of black cis hetero men. Like that fear of that they're dangerous and that you should be afraid of them and that you know they're you know deceitful and you know their those ideas can't even resonate within us when we internalize that type of shit you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying so I had to break those barriers for myself to be able to connect with them you know what I'm saying on a level that was more deeper so they can understand what trans means and you know our history as trans people and you know dealing with that on a level that was way more deeper than I would have expected. But of course, being in prison is shitty and the glamorization of it through media and the entertainment industrial complex is shitty. But um, I lived through that and I'm not gonna, I, I wasn't gonna let it break me down because that's what it's set up to do. It's supposed to, mm -hmm. you know, distort your brain and to put, instill fear in you and to mm -hmm. make you um, want to come back to that. Once you're in society and you feel like there's nothing left for you. And I was, I'll be damned if I let that resonate within myself. Mm -hmm. um, for the second question, it's definitely a lot of white people in here. I'm not gonna not say that. Um, and it just goes to show the connections that we have within our communities, our communities of color. You know, how many of the people in here even invited a person of color? So like, let's be real about that. It's not like it was, you know, the fault of people of color if people in here aren't telling people of color that there's an event like this happening. Um, also, it just goes to show again the, the cultural connection and the willingness and determination of people who want to know, you know, the truth of a trans woman of color and care about those issues and it's on some radical liberalist shit like I am. And so it's really Im important that, again, that we kind of break barriers with ourselves in, in situations where we feel like I can't do that or maybe I shouldn't do that is wrong because just inviting your other white radical friends is is not enough. It's like, what about the people of color? What and also people of color. Like, if you're in here and you didn't invite other people of color, then you're just as bad as the white people who didn't invite the people of color. So, like, think about what it is for you to start breaking down those barriers and the fear of, um, you know, black people in the black culture and. And because for me, I sp especially when I was, you know, I grew up in a, a middle class, you know, whitewashed black family. And like, it was like they wanted me to be afraid of other black people. They mm -hmm. wanted me to say, stay away from those black people because we're the good black people. Mm -hmm. And we have that mentality and that ideology that still live within a black culture. And it's like, no, because at the end of the day, I'm still black and I'm just seen as bad as the people we see as, or was taught was bad. And so like, I always challenged that when I was young. 
And I guess that's why I have a, a, a fear of dealing with people. You know what I'm saying? I've had guns pulled out on me and everything, and I still have not used that as an excuse to hate black people or to hate any culture because I've dealt with more hate from other cultures than I have from my own culture when people try to have this idea that you know, people of color, specifically black people, are the most homophobic or transphobic, and that's not the case. So we have to talk about those things when we think about the way that we organize. And is it kind of ties in with the all lives, I mean, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter campaign, Trans Lives Matter campaign, is still the separation of, you know, us as people because of our ideas of other cultures and not giving space for people to come in that and, and, and invite people in that because we can't just expect that people are going to walk in because we put a sign up. You know what I'm saying? We will have to make these people believe that it is worth them fighting for. And that's the idea of what's going on in here. But yeah, I mean, we can't control who shows up for CNC C. McDonald. That's that's only on the strength of the people who, you know, invite the people and the people who show up. Alrighty, so we have about ten minutes left. So I'm because we want to make sure we have time to throw it back to you for any last comments and then also to get our mixer on. So <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and do the two and two and then we'll go on. So do you feel it's important for trans attracted people to support your struggle and how important is it for trans attracted men to come out? And then the next question, uh, first you are awesome, um, let's see. Who in your life that you consider an ally? Can you talk about that relationship and what is integral to connect, um, to concretely maintaining it? Can you, what, what was that? So I'll read it again, I'm sorry. It's, um, who in your life that you consider an ally? Can you talk about that relationship and what is integral to concretely maintaining it? Okay. <laughs> so for the first question, um, I feel like the ideas of trans attracted people coming out is almost like a saying that we, that they have to identify as that. Um, and that would be kind of perpetuating the idea of uh, gender spectrums and and, and sexuality ideas, and I feel like I've been with my boyfriend for f uh, going on five years, and um, he doesn't see me as trans, so he sees me as a woman. So I don't. I mean, the idea of tra trans attracted people coming out is great but if a person is loving you and they only see you for the person who you are not caring if you're trans or whatever um then do we force them to to say that to prove something to society do does it make us does it reassure us or i mean i, I don't feel that it would make any difference if my boyfriend said that he, you know he was attracted to me because I was a trans woman or attracted to me because I was a woman. And I think our love is outside of gender. So I feel, yeah, it's, it's that, that, that question is very complex because, you know, I feel like a, a lot of that, a lot of why that is is because of society shaming of people who are attracted to trans people and also the misogyny that lives in that because trans men can can date whoever and not and not deal with the the same type of discrimination that a, a cis man would get for dating a trans woman. And so I feel like um, that question is more likely associated 
with cis straight men more so than it is with most any other sexes. But I feel like for any person who who is attracted to trans people, that they should that the only thing we can do is help them live in that truth and help them figure out how to identify that for themselves because we can't make them say that they're a trans attracted person because we don't know how they identify with themselves or with the person that they love. So that would just be another form of oppression is saying you have to love me this way because I'm telling you you have to love me this way. Or, you know, forcing someone to say something that that's just like somebody telling you that you have to say that you're a man if you're a trans woman or vice versa. It's like we can't make people have these titles. We can only expect that they will love us and respect us outside of our genders and you know our sexualities that they would just love us for us. So I don't feel like people that they should come out with but they should definitely be able to love whoever they want freely without the judgment and discrimination and scrutiny of society in general. Yeah. All right. The other question was, uh, let's see. Who in your life that you consider an ally, can you talk about that relationship and what is integral to concretely maintaining it? Um, who is that person? Well, I I want to say it was I want to say it's one person because um, connected to the question that um, he had asked me earlier about like I think any any relationship that I have with any person who's like in a fit activist um, feel or just in my personal life like my connections with those people are so deep and like we get each other on a level that's outside of the seriousness that a lot of people associate with activism like people feel like you have to be uh, a hard ass to be an activist and that you can't be that you can't take life um, fun that you can have fun in life like everything is serious for them so they miss those chances of connecting with people through that and I feel like all the people who know me like we have really strong connections and they're like my chosen family so I feel like that's what cre keeps me grounded it's not just one person but all the people who has showed their solidarity with me and I know that they're standing with me mm -hmm. uh, because we know each other on a deeper level and we connect in a way that is that is that is much more than s surfacely mm -hmm. it's really in depth and I, I, I like having that type of vulner, vulnerability with people, you know, because I feel like if I let myself go, not, not saying that, you know, I'm taking my kindness for granted because kindness can definitely be taken, uh, you know, be seen for weakness. Um, but I feel like I have no fear in that. And once people start having no fears and being vulnerable and being able to connect with people on a deeper level, then solidarity and allyship seems more concrete. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those connections that I have with a lot of people in my life in, um, so I can't say it's one person, but the people who are there are because of those deep spiritual, mental um, connections we have with each other. All right, so now the last two questions, um, at least from the stack. So let's see. Thank you for being so real and courageous. You spoke at length about bodies being the site of manipulation, accumulation, and sexual exploitation, yet, uh, discourse and legitimization around trans movements are based on body transition. 
Can you speak about the needs and validation of the larger gender queer community? And then the last question, please tell us how the mainstream media either helps or hurts our marginalized voices. What do we need? <coughs> um, I feel like, um, firstly, that with the sexism, the misogyny and trans misogyny that lives in society, it kind of, uh, it kind of, that itself in the LGBTQIA community. So trans women were left with the ideas of women through media and through the ball scene or whatever there was for them. And those ideas of womanhood were uh, more so fantasized ideas of women. Uh, the long flowy hair, the big hips, the big boobs, you know, living through that and having to deal with women telling me, I mean, specifically trans women telling me that, you know, you need to have this and that and you're not going to be a girl if you don't have this or that. And so that, when that, and since that is resonating in the LGBTQIA community, um, the ideas of trans bodies, are through the ideas of misogyny and trans misogyny. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we need to reclaim our bodies. We need to reclaim our transitions. We need to understand that we don't transition the same and our ideas of womanhood are different and you know, the way that we identify is different and that we should not have to look up or look at the next person to feel that we have to identify like them. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like as trans women uh, fighting for, you know, the right to exist in our bodies um, are constantly being challenged by the ideas that people have for us as trans women mm -hmm. and the stereotypes that people have placed on us, um, whether it be through the porn industry or through media stere stereotypes that they play and having most of those roles of trans women being played by cis people mm -hmm. and knowing that you know those are fantasized ideas of trans people and that's what people think of us and so they're constantly defining us and they're constantly um, labeling us and you know defining us in our bodies and uh, I feel like we need to uh, reproclaim that for ourselves to be able to connect with ourselves to have self-awareness and self-love and not depend on those ideas um, to live in society and feel that we have to conform because that's another form of conformity. It's the ideas of what womanhood is and not living in your own truth and your own womanhood and being able to live for yourself and also for trans men too. Like we have to live in our own truths, live in our own uh, bodies transition how we want to transition and, and not let other people make those decisions for us and you know just to live for ourselves. Oh, yeah, the second one. Oh. Please tell us how the mainstream media either helps or hurts our marginalized voices. What do we need? Um, there's definitely a thin line between the help and hurt um, ideas when it comes to marginalized groups. You see that black bodies are usually portrayed in the media as thugs or rappers or dead. And so um, it's really important that we think about how the entertainment industrial complex has, has 
is profiting off of these stereotypes of black people. You know, the angry black woman. I mean, I know people congratulate Kerry Washington for her role as a, a as a black woman working in the White House, but she's still playing the role of a, the angry black woman. And like, where? Why can't we just be everyday people? Why can't we just be the family across the street that likes to play bingo on Fridays or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be? They're still appropriating our blackness through the media. They're still stereotyping us through the media. And, uh, you know, I feel like even with, uh, you know, Laverne Cox being on Orange is the New Black and Janet Mock having her own show on MSNBC, um, that with our visibility um, comes the risk of trans women still being... uh, violated and um, killed now even more so at a higher rate than ever and so it's like it's it's great to see trans women having those positions in the media that that gives people a better perspective of the power of trans women in stepping out of those stereotypes but it also gives uh, people a reason to um, kind of retaliate more um, mm-hmm. through those, you know, through the ideas of hate and transphobia and you know bigotry and misogyny and trans misogyny and the and the fact that those are still women and how women are hated in this country too. So mm-hmm. it's like um, it's really important that we correct you know people when it comes to those ideas of what black people are i know a lot of people like empire but you know a lot of people challenge those ideas of black people in the entertainment industry and like those ideas that you know are stereotypes of black people and like you know, the ideas that um people of color can't be culturally diverse or, you know, outside of, you know, like when people tell me I'm talking white, like, I don't know what that means. Like, I'm not talking white, I'm talking like a human being. Like, what does it mean to talk black? What does that even look like? And so those ideas of what and how black people are portrayed in media gives people this idea of who I should be as a person and I can't even live in my own body as a black person without somebody appropriating my blackness or telling me or assuming how I am through the media. So it can be more detrimental than it can be helpful outside of seeing prominent uh, positions of power for people of color in the media. But outside of that, we're still living through those stereotypes. Alrighty, so thank you everyone for your questions. Um, yes. Alright, so I'm going to ask this last question and I'm sure that there are probably people from all sorts of groups that are in here, so there will be a space afterwards to have announcements as well. So the last question I have for you, what do you want people in this room leaving here tonight? to learn from your story and your choice not to give up, to not just be another number and just to fight for justice? What do you want people to leave with? Um, I want people to actually have listened to what I said, not just heard what I said, but listen to what I have said and actually try to change the things in their lives that can lead to um, falsehood or um, unassuredness or uh, self-unawareness to be able to love yourself and be free to love who you want and love how you want and love when you want and, and more importantly love yourself and to be aware of the issues that people are facing and not to just 
fantasize and romanticize our struggle and, and romanticize and fantasize that things will get better, but actually get active and get more active and get more active and continue to get active until we are all collectively working together on a unified one accord for progressive and liberative movements.